Okay, so we talked about uh, 3D texture mapping now, and uh, but of course we also have the 2D texture mapping, which is actually the thing that usually comes immediately to your mind when you think about texture mapping, because that is, of course, taking a 2D image and then put it onto a texture, a 3D object, in a similar way as you use, for example, a, a photo wallpaper uh, to decorate your room or... Uh, uh, like a, a paper to gift wrap. So uh, you, we take a, t a 2D object and place it onto a 3D object in a certain way. And the question is, of course, how do we do this mapping, which, uh, of course, is difficult for like something like a teapot, but it's more simpler for a simple shape just such as a sphere. And a typical example would be, of course, taking a world map and map it onto a sphere to create a globe. And this is, this is now the part where the UV is used in a texture space. And like I said, I'm following the book here. Um, what we often do here is, again, to make the calculation easier, is that we take the texture and map it to a 0, 1 texture space. So the U and V go from 0 to 1. And then we need a mapping from the sphere to the 2D object, which is, of course, seems difficult because we have a 3D object, so we have 3D points, I want to map them to 2D points, but it is actually quite simple. If you remember what we did when we talked about the parametric equation of spheres, we defined the sphere by these two parameters, which are two angles, the, uh, long, which we uh, interpreted also, or we used also the interpretation of it, uh, the, the anal analogy to the longitude and the latitude. And that we can describe each point on a sphere by these two angles. Now we want to go the other way around. Of course, we have a point in 3D and we want to have the corresponding map on the two, uh, the corresponding point on the 2D map. So what we do is we just take these, do some arithmetic transformations that bring the angle to one side and uh, I'm not doing it now because it would cost too much time. It's really a, a simple arithmetic transformation, uh, but it is a good exercise, of course, to do it at home. Uh, and then we can calculate the angle based on the coordinates of the point. And then, of course, we can map that to our vector space, uh, to our texture space. We just have to see where those angles are, and we see that when we look at to the image. By the way, the image that I uh, used for the sphere contained a few mistakes with the angles. Be careful with that. Uh, sorry for that, but I also warned you that I redo all the images this year, or most of them, to make it easier. And this is a lot of work, and it's all these you can easily uh, make a few mistakes. So be very careful uh, and critical with the images uh, if it really is, is correct. Um, and when you find mistakes, uh, can let me know. Uh, I will be uh, very happy to do that, uh, uh, to, to, to know that and, and correct it then. Um, so here, if you look at the angle, you see, of course, if we want to address all points on the sphere, the one angle here goes around it. So we have a full period from minus pi to pi. But if we then want to address all the points in set direction, of course, we only have to go in half space because the other half we reach by moving here and then going up here, which is why those angles are only from 0 to pi. And then we just do a simple mapping, which is here just dividing, uh, uh, subtracting it and then dividing it. And here, of course, because we have this minus pi and pi, the mapping is a little more complicated using this modular function. If you don't know what the mod function is, just uh, quickly look it up. It's uh, a simple thing. You will see this is a simple scaling transformation. Again, I'm not doing it because it costs so much time. It's very simple, but uh, it is a, a very good exercise to do this at home. Good. Now, uh, so we see for the sphere, we can use the parametric equation to map it for uh, triangles, which is actually the most case that we have, uh, the case that we have most in, in graphics, of course. Um, the mapping is, the basic idea of the mapping is, of course, simple, because the triangle is uh, a 2D object. Even if you place a triangle in a 3D space, it's still a flat 2D object. So the mapping to a 2D texture is uh, 
should be relatively simple. We just need to say where we want to place the triangle in the texture or where we want to place the triangle on the texture. So we take the vertices of the triangle and then we just define, we say, well, we want to have them here and then we end up with a texture like this. We can, of course, also say we want to have it here, then we have a texture like this. We could even say, well, we want to have it here, like if we have, for example, a texture is a flower, then we can say, well, we want to have a triangle like this. So the texture, and then we color this in the same color as the background. So we map the texture in a way that these points are outside of the actual texture or we can map it in a way that they are inside or that they are matching. This is completely up to us. We just need to define the mapping based on these vertices. But then, of course, the question is, how do we get the values in between? What we already talked about linear interpolation and a very good way to calculate this is actually something we talked earlier about, which are the barycentric coordinates. So you see here a lot of the stuff that I introduced at the beginning, the parametric equation for the sphere, which look kind of difficult to handle, or the barycentric coordinates, which look kind of, yeah, nice, but why, why do I need this? You see now how you can use them very easily, and if you have it in that form, how it makes the calculation much easier. And you see that here, because if you... You, for, for the barycentric coordinates, you see it here, if you represent the triangles with these barycentric coordinates, then of course you can use the same parameters here, the same coefficients here, as here, to walk along the line here. When you go along here and then you ask yourself, where, what color do I have to put here? Then you calculate the alpha, beta, uh, the beta and the gamma coefficients, and then you just use the same in your texture space texture space and then you get this color value here. So this is a very simple way to get the, the texture values by these uh, these barycentric coins. And that also shows I have only drawn the 2D case here but I said uh, because of course a triangle is a 2D object but if we place it in 3D of course uh, we have three co coordinate values here of the triangle but again we can still map them to 2D positions on our texture, and then we calculate the beta and the gamma values in 3D then, but these values are then exactly the same that we use here when we do the mapping. So you see this generalizes in a straightforward way to 3D. We just have 3D vectors in the, in the, uh, in the top case. Good. Yeah, that's already set. But there is, of course, one thing we have to be careful in 3D, because if we have 3D, then, of course, the perspective also changes when you move, when we have a triangle that we move at certain positions, and that can create some artifacts. So, for example, in this case, uh, illustrates it quite nicely. If you model this uh, checkerboard with two triangles, and then you do this uh, linear interpolation, with, uh, which you get with the barycentric coordinates, then you get this... this uh, a fine uh, transformation, this, this uh, artifact here that doesn't really look correctly. Um, the good thing about this is this is something that the hardware takes care of or the API takes care of, so usually we don't have to deal with that. Um, normally, of course, this, uh, uh, the purpose of this course is to explain you what the hardware actually does or what the APIs actually does, what is going on behind it. But this is some part that I want to skip because, I mean, we already have a lot of uh, mathematics here and a lot of details. But, uh, and, um, s but if you are interested in that, there is a chapter in the book explaining it, so you're very welcome to, to read that. But I will skip it here and just say, okay, this is one of the places where we just can rely on the hardware or should rely on the hardware. Uh, also because uh, to explain it, I would need perspective projection, which we'll cover later. Another thing that I would just like to mention, which uh, because uh, that is taken care of by the hardware, is this so-called MIP mapping, which, uh, but I want to mention it. So if you look into texture mapping, you will always uh, run over this MIP mapping term. So just that you know what it is. Um, the, the point or the problem with, with texture mapping is when you do it in 3D, of course, if the texture, if the object is closer to you or if you uh, go closer to an object, the object gets larger. That means you have to increase the size of the lecture of the, of the texture, which means if, if it gets larger, it gets uh, the, the resolution isn't good enough anymore. In the opposite way, when you move further away of it, the texture gets smaller. 
then of course the resolution doesn't play a problem so the, the the size is okay but then you do a lot of you have to do a lot of calcul uh, unnecessary calculations so think about you have a very very small object and a huge texture and then you calculate the influence of all the pixels on just those few handful of pixels that represent your object that is very far in the distance that is a lot of computation that is basically unnecessary and even if you are at the position where you say here the resolution of the texture might be uh, is actually uh, exact is, is perfect you might have a misalignment when you do the mapping that results in some artifacts and this is where the the mid mapping comes into place and the mid mapping is basically just you take a texture and then the api automatically calculates different images that are optimized for different distances and then dynamically based on the depth of the object that you have where you put your texture on it just picks the right size of image or the right size of the texture to if it's very small a smaller one to reduce the calculation uh, the, the processing time if it's very large a one with a higher resolution to increase the uh, uh, the quality of the image so again, this is something that the hardware takes care of. I'm just mentioning it here because yeah, you run a lot into, into it when you work with texturing. Good, so this is the, the basic ideas of texturing. Now uh, <clears throat> we can use, of course, texturing also in other contexts. And one of them is the so-called bump mapping. So to, uh, um, if, you, uh, if you think about it, one, one of the reasons why we're doing this texturing is that we say, if we have a very uh, a, a surface that is not that regular but that is uh, kind of uh, bumpy and rough then of course it's very difficult to model that and it's very computationally expensive to model that so instead we're just pasting an image onto it but what we could also do is we could of course say well um, if we have a regular surface and we calculate the light here we have the normal vector like this but if we have like a more bumpy surface then of course the normal vectors would be like that and that is of course then the part where the modeling becomes difficult and also the calculation becomes difficult and the idea of this bump mapping is now to say well we just take uh, a texture that doesn't contain color values but that contains normal values and those normal values represent for example this regular structure here or represent this chaotic structure here and then if we use those for the light calculation we get light information here that we would get also if we would calculate normal vectors based on that irregular surface and that is the basic idea of, of bump mapping we say we take a flat surface but instead of having the perpendicular normal vectors we multiply we take the vectors from the texture so we map the texture array to pixels again but these values in the array do not represent color values but represent normal vectors and then we choose them for example in this way uh, it's probably hard to see here on the on the projection but if you look at the teapot you see here that you have these bumps here which you see because the light here creates some shadow here and some brighter spots here and that is exactly what you achieve by using these normal vectors here so it's basically just a trick to create the illusion by putting the light appropriately and that light appropriately is done by using a texture that represents this structure and that way you can really create this this nice rough surfaces where you see everything is red here the differences only come from the different light how the light is reflected based on the shadow and the reflections that are created which are considered by the normal vectors in the texture the problem here is of course this only works on the surface but it doesn't work on the borders because we still have a flat border and that is dealt with another approach which is called the displacement mapping which takes it one step further which says well if we multiply that instead of multiplying with a normal vector map that simulates these normal vectors of a bumpy surface why don't we multiply it with a bumpy surface in the first place so we take a texture of error uh, uh, of uh, vectors but in this case i should have wrote this down so these are the normal vectors and these are the the, the normal vectors no these are the normal vectors n and these are the 
we, we calculated normal vectors n star and these are the displacement vectors. So these are vectors that we use to modify our model in a way that we really create this bumpy structure on the model and then we calculate the, uh, the vector space on that bumpy structure and then we get of course something that also produces the right texture here, uh, the right uh, color here, because we change the actual geometry of the object where he's here. It's only an apparent change of the object because of the shape of the object because we're just manipulating the normal vectors. But of course this is way more computationally expensive, so you have to have a trade-off between is the shape really important, then you should, should go for the displacement mapping, which is computationally more expensive, or do you say, well, I live with those artifacts for the sake of speed, then you can go, uh, should go with bump mapping. Another form of texturing, a final form, a uh, variation of texturing I want to talk about is, uh, quickly talk about is so-called environment mapping, where we say, um, uh, which is often used to create reflection on an object, because if you think about, of course, what, what uh, if you have an object, you want to create a reflection, you would have to model the whole environment, but instead of modeling the whole environment, you can just also take a photo of the environment in the same way as you put a photo wallpaper in your room and then pretend you're living in Hawaii or on the beach. Um, and uh, this is, wait, here, that is the, the image that illustrates it. So you have an object and you want to have the environment reflected in that object and then what you do is basically place a cube around that object, put the environment on the cube in a way as it is illustrated here at the top right, and then you say, you remember, if you remember what we said for the font shading, we said we have a perfect reflection when the incoming i vector, when the angle between the incoming i vector and a normal vector is the same as the vector of the, reflect, uh, of the incoming reflection then we have a mac uh, of the of the incoming light then we have a maximum reflection which also means if we really want to have a reflection we have to look at that reflection vector so we take the i vector e calculate the angle between the normal and then we take that angle to construct the reflection ray and then we see where the ray hits our our texture and that is then the point that we put here for a perfect reflection. Or if we don't want to have perfect reflection, but just have the influence of the environment here, then of course we, uh, we modify the color a little bit, but that is the, the idea that we have this reflection from the environment by placing a texture that represents the environment and then following these reflection vectors. Good. Yeah, so the last three I just gave you a rough idea. And, uh, but yeah, that should pretty much illustrate it. And uh, I think in the practice, you also have a couple of examples where you have different kinds of uh, texturing, uh, uh, usage of different kind of texturing, and also using normal maps for texturing and not just images for texturing. Good. Are there any questions about the, the texturing? No? Good. Then I have uh, another thing before I come to the final thing I want to say today. Um, this is already the sixth lecture that we have of 12 lectures that we have, so it's half time, which is why I usually make a little break and show a little movie because especially the first part is a lot of mathematics and very few graphics, so at least at half time you deserve also a little break. Good, so yeah, uh, a little break at halftime. Um, like I said, if you did everything that we did so far, you already did quite a lot. I warned you at the beginning, there's a lot of material. Now, the other reason why I'm showing this at uh, halftime is, of course, to remind you that you also have to pass an exam, a midterm exam. And I'm always saying, I hope you do a little bit better, not only a little bit better. Um, so uh, just a reminder, this is the last lecture before the midterm exam because we have next week this uh, Herr Kanzing break and then the Tuesday before it there is no lecture. So uh, <coughs> the midterm exam, make sure to check the, the online information and at uh, OSIRIS uh, before but it should be at that time and that place. 
Um, a few comments, of course, the, the usual thing. Be there and know everything. Um, it's a closed book exam, so no books, notes, and we also usually say no electronic equipment also, so some people bring their cell phone to use uh, as a clock. But of course, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, with the cell phones, you can do so many things today that you, we cannot allow it to use it. Okay, um, yeah, and preparation. Be careful for those of you who do it a second time this year, it's different. We have the, wait, yeah, no, yeah. lectures one to six are covered, so also this lecture today is part of it. Usually it's only one to five, but we changed it this year because we have this different arrangement now that it's after the Herr Kanzing week, um, which actually makes more sense because then it splits six and six lectures and not five and seven. Um, but of course now it's a little more, but that means also, uh, but also you have uh, a little more time to prepare next week. Uh, Content-wise, like I said, the lectures and the tutorials. So if you prepare, look at the lecture material again, look at the, tutorial, look at the textbook and look at the tutorials. Um, <clears throat> A comment in relation to that, um, the tutorials, the questions from the tutorials, you see that probably also from the solutions. Some of it is also uh, a little more to deepen your understanding of here or to introduce certain stuff that I'm not covering here. And some of the answers are more like explanations to understand it and not like something you would ask in an exam, which is why I'm always saying the, the tutorials are kind of in between the lecture and the exam. So you have the lecture where I'm explaining you a lot of stuff, and then you have the tutorials where it's still, you're doing it yourself, but there is still a lot of uh, explanation and understanding. And then the exam questions are then testing if you understood it, which means for the preparation, you can also look at the older exams to get a better idea about what the exercises are. I always send them to our Esquadrat, so they should have them. Uh, also, they are on the websites. If you go to the first page on the website, there is at the bottom, there are the links. And um, be careful, of course, because this last lecture was used to be after the midterm exam. Of course, in the old midterm exams, there are no exercises, no ex uh, questions about texturing because they are all in the final exam. So we prepare for that, look into the final exams. Uh, anything else? Yeah, be reminded um, because of the Herr Kanzing break next week, there are only two more tutorials, um, one today and the other one then the following week, Tuesday, um, the tutorial, the second part about the, the texturing, I didn't put it online because I made some last minute changes on the lecture and I wanted to wait with the tutorials before I put it online, but it should be online either today or tomorrow. Um, next week then no tutorials and then the Tuesday before we also we say no lecture because it doesn't make sense to already go ahead two days before the exam. So that means for you, you have more time to prepare, but you also, of course, have time to go to the tutorials uh, and uh, ask about uh, questions of preparation for the exam, which is then today in two weeks. So are there any questions related to that? No? Then I hope to see you all well prepared in two weeks.